There was a poet one time who said that the universe isn't made of atoms, it's made of stories. That's certainly true of the universe and the mind. And most stories involve suffering. There's a passage where the Buddha uses the pattern of dependent core rising to describe, he usually uses it for describing the origin of suffering, but he also says it's the origin of the world. Our sense of the world comes from the processes of dependent co-arising. They start with ignorance and then end with suffering. But there's another passage where he goes through dependent co-arising and arrives at suffering, and then he says the next step is conviction. In other words, you looking for a way out, and you decide you found the way out in the, in the story of the Buddha, because that's what conviction is all about. And it's through that conviction that we can actually get the strength of mind, and get the motivation to practice, so we can find a way out of suffering. And the main topic of conviction is being convinced of the Buddha's awakening. Now that's a story that helps lead out. And it shows us how the Buddha led out of all those narratives and all the other stories that had bound him for so long. You remember the first knowledge he gained on the night of his awakening was the knowledge of his previous lifetimes. Aeons and aeons and aeons. And when you see so many stories like that, the stories themselves begin to become meaningless. He was born with a certain name, lived in a certain species or clan, had this experience of pleasure and pain, this was the food he ate, then he died. That was it, again and again and again, same pattern over and over again. It gave him a sense of urgency, a sense of terror, actually, when we translate Sangwega, it's good to remember that it's not just dismay, but it also means terror, that if this process doesn't end, it's just going to keep on and leading to more and more and more suffering. But notice how the dimension of time changes the meaning of the stories. It's an immense dimension of time. As he once said, you can't find a beginning point of time. Or he says it's inconceivable. It's so out there that you can't even think about it. And he talked about how he would use this sense of time when he was teaching his students. He said, it's hard to find someone who hasn't been your mother, someone who hasn't been your father, someone who hasn't been your brother or sister, son or daughter. And this is especially true of people who are close to us. The person who is now your mother might have been your son in a previous lifetime. Your daughter might have been your brother. I mean, it gets mixed up again and again and again, all kinds of combinations. And when the Buddha talked about how you know, all the people you meet are probably have probably been your mother at one point, it wasn't to give rise to a sense of compassion for everybody you meet. It was to give rise to a sense of terror and a desire to get out. So we think about how difficult our relationships are with our parents and with our children and our siblings. Well, it hasn't been just this way in the 20th and 21st centuries. It's always been difficult. We keep going back and getting entangled over and over again. And so what the Buddha looked for was a way to dissolve these entanglements and dissolve these stories. That's why I went to the second knowledge. The question was, how is it that people are reborn? Because when he looked at his own many, many lifetimes, he didn't see the pattern. As to why. Sometimes he was a deva, sometimes he was down in hell, sometimes he was an animal, sometimes he was a human being. What was the pattern? He's commented how a lot of people who gain knowledge of previous lifetimes come to all different kinds of conclusions, because it's a very complex process. But with that second knowledge, he saw it was all because of our karma, our intentions, the intentions we act on, and the views we have. And 
And that insight, too, began to dissolve a lot of the stories, the stories where you've been the victim of something or somebody's actions. We have to accept the fact that we've probably victimized other people in the past, not necessarily the person who's victimizing you now, but somebody. And it makes the desire for justice seem, seem petty, trying to get back at somebody. Because that's why we keep coming back again and again. There's a poly term, wera, which means basically the animosity where someone has done you wrong and you want to get back at them. And that's what leads people to be reborn. And then they get back, and then the other side wants to get back, and who, who knows how the story started. started. So this too should give you a sense of dispassion, disenchantment with the whole process. So it's not just at large dimensions of time, but also large dimensions of space, all the different levels of being. And the Buddha thought there was no happiness to be found, or no lasting happiness to be found. Which means that no matter how much we care for other people, we can't be responsible for their happiness. There's nobody in charge. Remember that chant we do again and again. There's no one in charge. Well, this is what it means. There's no plan. There's no rhyme or reason to the universe. It has its patterns. And as with any complex system, if you learn how to manipulate the patterns, you can use them to get out. That's the Buddhist recommendation. Because we've been good to one another, we've been bad to one another. But you have to realize you can't be there always for somebody. This is why I chant for goodwill. It says, may all beings look after themselves with ease. You're not promising to be there for them, because you can't. You can be there for a little bit, but then there comes a point where it's beyond your control. So is there value in all of this? Well, the Buddha said, you, the path out is the most valuable thing. Having right view, having, having your virtue. He says, there are times when people are tempted to go against their virtue, either for fear of losing their relatives, or from harming their health, or from harming their wealth. He says, health, wealth, relatives, losing those is nothing, nothing important. He was the same person who said we have this immense gratitude, debt of gratitude to our parents, but at the same time he says if, if it comes to the precepts, you have to hold on to the precepts as being more valuable. Because if you break the precepts for the sake of your relatives and everybody dies, and then what are you left with? You're left with a karma. And you're also left with having set a bad example for your relatives or your friends or the people who saw what you did. That can have an impact for a long time. So it's good to think about these first two knowledges of the Buddha, because they put things into perspective in huge amounts of time, and you might as well say infinite time, infinite space. And we're dealing with individual people right now, but you have to think of it in terms of that much larger picture that you have goodwill for one another, you try to help one another as you can. But you can't really be there for anybody else, for any really secure length of time. The best thing we can do for one another is to be kind to one another and set a good example through our own practice, and try to dissolve the stories away as much as we can. This is what the Buddha's awakening knowledge is. It's a solvent. It's a, called a universal solvent to dissolve all the worlds that we've been involved in, all the stories we've been involved in. Because when we get down to the Four Noble Truths, and that's the third knowledge, beings and worlds disappear. It's just suffering and the acts of the mind that lead to suffering. In other words, the things that you experience directly inside that nobody else can experience. Each of us has to experience these things on our own, the suffering, the things inside that lead to suffering, and also the qualities we can develop that can take us beyond suffering. 
There are no stories there. When you're really with the breath, there's no story there. Then you can make a little story about how last night I meditated really well, I stayed with the breath. But if you were to give a really detailed story of your meditation, well, the breath came in, then the breath came out, then the breath came in again, then went out again, then it came in again, went out again, adjusted a little bit, then it came in again. Not much of a story. When you get to nirvana, there are no stories at all, no suffering at all. So the Buddha's knowledge is a solvent for all the stories and all the suffering that we've been creating, and we've been creating with other people. Now other people may continue to want to create suffering, but you can't say, well, I'm going to put my practice aside for their sake, because they're just going to keep on wanting to create suffering. You can't keep on playing their games. There comes a point where you have to say, enough. And you do it with kindness, and you do it with firmness. And you remember what your true valuables are, not your relatives, not your wealth, not your health. Your right views and, and your virtue. Those are the things you can really hold on to. Because if you lose those, you lose an awful lot. You just go back into that maelstrom of worlds again. And who knows when you're going to come out again. There's an image in the Divine Comedy, Francesca de Rimini. She's in a whirlwind with her lover. And Donnie tries to talk to her, but she keeps getting whirled around every now and then. She, her face appears again in the midst of the whirlwind. They t exchange a few words, and before the sentence is done, she's off again. And that's what our encounter with one another is like in these worlds. We pass briefly. So we try to make whatever message we can get to another a kind message, a helpful message, but ultimately realizing that each of us has to be responsible for his or herself, his or her own happiness. I've told you the time when I was first ordained, there's another young man who was ordained at the same time. He was going to get married, and his fiance said she didn't want to marry someone who hadn't been a monk. So he was going to ordain for a couple of weeks. Well, at the end of the couple of weeks, he decided he really liked being a monk. It was something he didn't expect at all. So the day before, his parents and his fiancée came to pick him up at John Fu and gave a talk on how much debt we have to our parents. And so the monk eventually was willing to go back home to Sarov and get married, in line with what his parents and his fiancée wanted. Then I started thinking about my own parents and my own family. A couple days later, John, I mentioned this to John Fu, and he said, look, we were born in this world, we come alone, we go alone. Nobody hired us to be born. We have to figure out our own meaning in our own lives, find happiness for ourselves. We try to do it wisely and not harm anybody, but ultimately it's each person for him or herself. It's something of a paradox. As he answer told the young man, we didn't come into the world alone. They told me we come into the world alone. A different teaching for different people at different places in their practice. But as practitioners, we have to realize, okay, we're here because we realize we can't find happiness in the world. The world is not there to give us happiness. And all the stories that make up our worlds are not going to end unless we take the Buddha's awakening, have conviction in the Buddha's awakening as the way out. That provides a solvent that can dissolve these stories away. And it's only then that true happiness can be found, that happiness that doesn't harm anybody. Because that's the other part of these worlds that we go through, these stories we go through. Even as we're trying to help one another, we end up harming one another in lots of ways. So the best course of action is try to find a way out.